<clears throat> will obviously uh, occupy a very small piece of the floor. So I, I'm really, thank you very much for the kind invitation and I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. It would have been a, a great meeting to come to and, uh, and, and I'm really sorry, but such is life sometimes. So, so I'm glad you could provide this space and I, what I would like to do uh, this morning is to uh, talk you through what we're trying to achieve with Elixir as a infrastructure for life science data in Europe and, and hopefully at the end um, give a little bit of flavor of how I think it can be important for initiatives such as Transmart. Now I'll talk um, a little bit about the project that was mentioned in the introduction. So uh, Elixir is, an, is a research infrastructure and, and so we are not a project. Uh, we are a permanent entity funded by European member states and, and our remit is really to connect national centers for uh, life science data or bioinformatics uh, and uh, international organizations such as Assemble EBI into a, a single sustainable infrastructure for research data. And I think this sustainability remit is, is really important and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. What, what I also want to say is that, I mean, the talk today obviously for, for the Transmart community will focus a lot on biomedical research, but um, where all organisms are at the heart made of the same stuff, um, <clears throat> and the large biomolecular archives of course spans the whole of life science research, and, and we do have active activities in, in other fields such as agriculture or or biotechnology or uh, biodiversity, environmental and, and basic biology research. So, so why is something like uh, Elixir uh, created and, and <laughs> what is, why would you need to start a, a, a transnational initiative for life science data? But I think we all know that, uh, that we have a significant data challenge in, in the life sciences and of course uh, as a European infrastructure we, we have a slightly uh, European bias. And, and I think what is interesting to note is data production is increasing, uh, of course, in all biomedical research centers or biological research centers. And I think as a biomedical community, we have a challenge which is that we are distributed. And if we can compare ourselves to other really big data producers in, in for instance, physical or uh, astronomical sciences, we uh, don't have a single machine at a single site where the data needs to be spread out to the research community. Rather, we have a many-to-many -many problem where uh, a researcher in sense would quite like to see uh, the sequences and detect what has been done around phenotypes for breast cancer patients in Spain and, and vice versa. And so how do we then manage this many-to-many -many problem and how do we enable sharing of data between many quite independent actors in a standardized way and I think that's one of the really important challenges for the life sciences. Uh, we of course have a very rapid data gro uh, growth and, and I think we're all dwelled on this. This is of course initially driven by the genomics revolution but, but now it's uh, also uh, metabolomics, proteomics and um, uh, imaging is, is another important component of this. And so this slide just shows the total disk storage at Emberly BI, which is now over 70 petabytes. And I think th this matters at, at the technical level, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to do in terms of technical services, because the, the growth and the volume of many of the large reference databases are now such that they, they are quite challenging to store in regional or national computing centers. And so one need to think about how to deploy um, calculation tools very close to where the data is stored. And again, I think that will have to drive a completely different approach to what we've had before. We need to think much more about standards and APIs and so on in, in terms of how we organize ourselves. Then, of course, for biomedical research and translational research, we have the, the LC issues that surround the access and governance of human-derived research data. And, uh, and of course we operate often very, very close to the medical or the healthcare systems and, and so with that we do have uh, I mean, both a legal but also I think uh, ethical responsibility to, to manage data well. But we also need to think about how we do this in terms of processes so that we don't unduly hinder research because 
uh, it's very easy to lock data into a safe, but that, that will not necessarily drive uh, results forward. And, and I think we're all, we're all familiar with these challenges. Despite this, and I think this is this is quite important actually, is that we have uh, both in the, in Europe and and of course in the U.S. Uh, open data mandates from many of our funders. So there is an expectation that data is made available for reuse after the end of a project, and and I'll come back to that and talk a little bit about how we're trying to drive what we call fair data, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. But, but ultimately, we do have, in many of our projects, we have a contractual obligation with the funder to make data re reusable and available to other researchers at the end of the project. And, and of course, as an infrastructure, then Elixir, we are trying to facilitate uh, the work for the research community in terms of data deposition and data management. And I think this is where the distributed nature, the fact that we are connecting national centers is really, really important. So in Alexa now we have uh, 20 countries have joined um, the infrastructure and, and jointly that represent over 160 research centers throughout Europe. So really I think it's an unprecedented opportunity to drive and implement standards, APIs and, uh, and interfaces in a collaborative way across uh, many different institutes and, and importantly in a transnational setting, which I, I think will be a uh, really a valuable experience when we look at the, the governance of uh, access controlled human derived uh, data. And, and I think that the fact that we are backed by, uh, we are not a project, we are backed by uh, national research funders, um, gives us a longevity and ability to plan over slightly longer uh, time uh, timelines, and so in that sense we are similar to many of the, the big machines infrastructures, and, and really this, I'll come back to this long-term sustainability, but I think that that is really, really important because uh, you will only see investment in standards and adoption in, in standards of standards and APIs if people believe that they will stick around for a long time. So I, I said we, we are a network of nodes, we connect national centers. The advantage this gives, of course, is that the nodes which are funded through national uh, roadmaps or national funding schemes, they of course align very well with national strength and priorities, and they also help to create a national framework for resource management. Uh, I show here the example of the, the Spanish Institute of Bioinformatics, which brings together eight uh, different centers, a whole uh, across the whole of Spain in, into one network. But other examples in, in other countries, for instance, the Swedish uh, Alexia node have a, uh, an aside responsibility to mint DOIs for data sets that need long-term storage in the Swedish uh, life science archives, and, and so on and so forth. But, but the other uh, opportunity that this really provides us with uh, when is the is the fact that we can build uh, expertise and services around strong research centers. Now, I like to give the example more uh, if you go down the corridor in Bergen, you can see and of course that gives you yourself as a distribution organization opportunity to tap into these sources of local expertise and indeed um, a lot of our marine activities are coordinated and led by the Norwegian node, uh, simply because it's it's one of the real flagships on their national research agenda, and they see significant investment in, the, in this area. So, <clears throat> what we're trying to do in Elixir is to bring together services from our different uh, and uh, and the different nodes, and we have done that in what we call. Uh, platforms, so we are coordinating uh, this at national level. Each of these platforms are led by a uh, leadership team or a steering committee of uh, scientists, uh, PIs from our member states, so that are appointed by states, and and we work in five areas. So we're looking at uh, data and trying to sustain and and interconnect the the life science data infrastructure in Europe and the data resources, uh, and I'll say a few words about that. 
uh, we're looking at tools, uh, supporting community benchmarking of tools, um, building up registries for tools, and I think that's been over the last year where these registers can, can be used to, for instance, annotate, automatically annotate the uh, Docker instance. We're looking at uh, e-infrastructure or cyber infrastructure services in what we call our compute platform. So how do you access, how do you exchange, and how do you store uh, data and access to compute? Uh, and we're looking at our interoperability and identify and manage those. And of course, none of this would work without a training program. And and I think this is this is really important. Because we are in the training coordinators group, um, which represents uh, the, the the coordinators for the national uh, training programs in, in most of our member states. And actually, a number of the Alexi nodes have quite large training programs. So, these programs. And, and I think this is important because there is a significant, as we all know, quite a significant training need. And, and for instance, we've done things like the software and uh, data carpentry uh, courses that have been sold out in just a few hours and, and so on. So in, in the next um, couple of minutes, and I, I do sincerely hope that people interrupt if if uh, the voice or the images doesn't work uh, remotely. But in, in the next um, section, I, I'd like to say a little bit about how we work with our large data resources and why I think the, the reference resources are really important for biomedical research. And, and a lot of this centers around this paradigm of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And, and I think this is a really um, interesting slide I've got from Joe McIntyre, who runs the European PubMed Central at, at the EBI. So a couple of years back, they looked at how different data resources and data sources were cited in full text open access articles. And I think what, what this slide shows is that there is uh, quite a significant reuse of uh, life science data, and I think we all know that. You, you will need uh, things like uh, Ensemble or Uniprot to, to annotate the variants or to understand the effect of uh, um, mutations or just uh, looking up uh, the function of, um, of different proteins when you do a, a microarray or an RNA-seq experiment. It will be difficult to do enrichment studies and so on without these databases. But I think what, what it shows and what is interesting is to look and compare the usage of well annotated, curated data resources, uh, which are things like the ENA, the Protein Data Bank, OMIM, uh, GEO, and so on, uh, versus um, unannotated resources that are deposited as, as DOIs, the sort of the long tail of research data. And, and de facto, and, and this is a few years ago, but de facto there is virtually no reuse of research data in the public domain unless it's been carefully curated with, uh, with solid metadata. And I think this is, this is a really good message and a strong message that we want to send to the funders with open data mandates, that it is not enough to deposit data in, in open access. You actually, for this to generate downstream value, you need to spend some time to think about and curate the metadata. And, and as computational scientists, I, I think we all know and understand this, but, but I think it's, a, it's an important message to get across to the funding community. And in particular, I think it's really interesting to look at the, the Protein Data Bank, which is actually a very, very small archive. It's only around 10, 100,000 records. But, but over a quarter of all citations comes from this relatively small archive, and, and of course the, the reuse of PDB data has driven the whole field of structural bioinformatics for decades. And so if you have a source of well annotated high quality research data, it's quite likely that that will be reused by other scientists who just find interesting things to do with it. And I think that, that again is, is a very clear statement of value. We can see that every record in PDB is cited on average three times, for instance. The 
thing which is why these reference databases are, are important is that they cross-link. And so <laughs> the, if you look at something like uh, Ensemble, um, Ensemble wouldn't really exist without all the annotations that it brings in from other uh, data resources. If you look at a resource like Uniprot, it is really an integration hub. It links out to almost every other database, major database uh, that exists. And so it really serves as an integrator of information. And, and if you look and study the pattern of users, you will see that they often click through and walk through these links. And so it's not only the citation patterns that benefit from well-annotated cross-linked data, but also the, the way that people use and interact with that, with these databases, uh, on, uh, underlines the, the importance of, of uh, solid metadata. And this is not only reused, of course, in, um, in, science, in, in academic research, but it's actually also actively used by companies. And so I often like to argue that these solid reference databases, the Uniprots, the ENAs, and the, the GEOs of this world, or the GenBanks of this world, they, they really are a critical part of our bioeconomy. They're, they're sort of a modern bioeconomy infrastructure. And we looked at how they were used in patterns, and, and we saw in the last five years there were 30,000 patterns that, that just used bioinformatic repositories to define the subject matter. This is how you define a gene in a personalized medicine pattern. This is how you define an enzyme in a washing powder. You point to Uniprot or you point to RefSec. And so again, I think this is uh, an important message to, to science funders when we come back to talk to sustainability. We need to help them to express the value of these sort of infrastructures in order to secure uh, a long-term uh, funding mechanism. And, and I know that there is uh, also discussions in the Transmart community around sustainability. And I think we can actually learn something from these sort of, of value studies it is really important to help the science funders to express the value in a way that the funders of funders understand, i.e. The, the finance departments and the treasuries, who not necessarily are interested in science, but do understand hard economic arguments. So, so I think this is something that we are quite keen on in Elixir, is to help uh, our resources and the community to express the value which is accessible to funders, and so in partnership with them, we can help to define and sustain this infrastructure. And one of the ways that we've done that is a, is a piece of work led by Joe McIntyre from the European PubMed Central and Christina Durinks from the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, where they've tried to um, agree with quite a large community what kind of uh, indicators or metrics should you actually use to assess the value of uh, data infrastructure in the life sciences? And I think this was quite timely. Uh, we just published a, a preprint or an article on faculty thousand research on this. And, and if you, um, uh, you may be aware that the, the National Cancer Institute in the US just had a consultation open on, on the very same topic, and, and we of course our paper to that consultation. But I think it, it is important that one help the funders to understand the value of this in a consistent way. And I think being consistent about these things is one of the things that Elixir can bring to the community and help in long-term sustainability discussions. And I thought I would end with this, which is, <laughs> I think, slightly pessimistic. But uh, this comes from a report by Science Europe, which is uh, the Federation of European uh, National Science Funders, so the, the corresponding to NIH and NSF in, in Europe. And they had a survey earlier this year where they actually looked at the cost of research data management and research data information uh, across their different members. And I think if you, if you look at the dark blue, uh, part of uh, the two bar graphs, this is the I don't know answer from their members. And so so I think it's it's quite uh, shocking that over 30% of the, the national research funders in Europe actually really don't know how, how large part of their budget goes to research data management. But I think we, we all know that work in the field that it is a significant chunk of the cost in any 
uh, large life science research project these days, and, and particularly in translational research projects, I think it's very easy to underestimate this cost. But I, but I also think that you can view these graphs as a big opportunity as a community, because if we work in partnership with the funders to help to define this better, they will be very receptive to our arguments, because they, they are of course not pleased with the science funders, are not um, very comfortable with not knowing the cost of something which they instinctively know is central to most of their research, uh, funded research projects these days. So with that, I'd like to, to uh, uh, sort of move on from sustainability to some of the other activities that we are running in the lecture. And I thought I would give, uh, before moving into the translational data, I, just a few examples from our compute platform. And uh, in our compute platform, we are essentially, we're working on three implementation teams and three major tasks. So one is about cloud integration, most of our member states and most of the national bioinformatics infrastructures have access to a uh, cloud environment and of course we would like to make them as interoperable as possible. We would like to make it possible to, for instance, deploy Docker instances across these different clouds. We also would like to uh, help to exchange data between the secure clouds. We have a storage and data transfer task force which is currently focusing on setting up a um, quality controlled network for data transfer between these compute centers. And so we run things like uh, heartbeats and try to put on Globus and Grid FTP endpoints to make it easy and convenient for the resource and uh, compute resource managers to transfer the user's data between our, our different clouds. And the last part, which I think is really important, is our authentication and authorization infrastructure, where we are trying to essentially build a single sign-on layer for many of the life science resources in Europe. And, and I thought I would say a few words on this, because I, I think it's um, actually quite important and helpful if we think of translational data. So, so what is it we're trying to do to, to build up registered, if you want, Elixir users or an Elixir ID? Well, a feather of different authentication and authorization infrastructure, and, and a lot of this already exists as services from the national network providers in Europe. We try to build on top of this is um, a group of attribute management systems and uh, authentication to bring together, uh, for instance, the home organization, ORCIDs, or things like Google accounts for some users. Now, of course, this comes with a very different level of assurance, and so we're also looking in to see how you can provide step-up authentication for sensitive services, and uh, how we can do resource authorization management, for instance, for data sets that require DAC approval. Um, I should say, and that's the last box on this, that uh, a lot of these are, uh, as many of you know, quite standard technologies, and a lot of it will come down to how do we actually manage the, the governance side uh, of this through things like code of conducts and, and different policies, institutional maturation models, and, and for instance, bona fide management of, of individuals and the research status. Um, we are currently just rolling out the first components of this technology in production and during next year we will run quite limited pilot actions with a few resources to start to test out the different components in in the, in the real production setting and I think in particular the last box on governance it will have to inform a lot of our processes for governance but uh, hopefully this will be um, uh, available in the not too distant future and we are starting to look to see how we can use this for um, providing access to sensitive or restricted access data sets. So what are we uh, doing around uh, genomics and translational data and, and how can we help to work closer with uh, the translational research and the Transmart community? So I thought I would, I would give you a few examples of, of activities that we've done in Elixir, and, and a lot of them center around the European Genome Phenome Archive, which is a, a database 
at um, uh, EBI and the Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona to books. But, but I think there is a common theme in what we've done, which is, and, and I'm sure you'll, you'll know this, that it can be a quite a bumpy road <laughs> in the translational research uh, project when it, when it comes to data management. And I think what we, we are trying to do is essentially uh, attack these bumps one by one and see if we can start to, to smoothen the road. Uh, and, and I think a lot of this will not happen in Elixir. It will happen in partnership with the national research communities and with uh, uh, um, grassroots organizations or broad alliances such as the Global Alliance for Genomic and Health. And I, I think we all have a common interest to, to help people to search and request um, internationally potentially identifiable uh, uh, data and, and we've done this on, on various levels and so what I thought I would do is to talk you through some of the examples as, as a basis for what I hope will be an interesting discussion at, at the end of the talk. So just as, as a little bit of a background around the, the EGA because I will mention that in, in the coming slides. So this is a an archive based at the EBI and the, in the CRG in Barcelona, Spain. It's a joint venture between those two institutions. And, and it was launched in, in around 2008 and initially contained the, the Wellcome Trust case control studies from the Case Control Consortium. It is a secure archive for controlled distribution of consented genetic and phenotypic data sets. It's, if you want, a sister archive to the dbGaP in the US. Uh, but an important dis difference is that it's not only NIH studies. Uh, the EGA accepts submissions from uh, pretty much any researcher as long as they have the, the, the governance of the data in place. There are about 7,000 or 7,500 users uh, that requested access to these uh, data sets. There are about uh, 300 or a bit over 360 submission accounts. And the, date, the archive itself have about 3.3 uh, petabytes archive. And uh, there are a little bit over uh, 100 terabytes of data ingested every month. And there's about a little bit over 100 terabytes of data going out for reuse every month. So it, it's actually quite a, uh, an active archive. And uh, as you see, there is also quite a lot of contacts to the help desk to both for access and for submission. So I think the, the, the take-home message from this slide is that if you make uh, even access control data where you need to apply for access to data, data access committee, if you make that available, the research community will use it and, and find the need for it. Uh, so one, one of the things that we do in Alexia, because one of course one challenge with these archives is that not all uh, not all human research data will get a pass to submit it to an archive. It may not be desirable to submit it to an archive. And so we uh, have an effort that we call the local EGA, which is really a way of uh, store access control sensitive data uh, locally, either at the national or at an institutional level, but actually integrate the metadata globally in EGA, which will make it more discoverable and more accessible to the research community. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is early days. It's it's one year into a four year project, and so we will have a first prototype scheduled for December this year with a few national partners. And um, over the next two or three years, I, I hope we'll be able to roll this out uh, a little bit wider. Uh, but uh, uh, at this stage, we have a very early prototype with a, a select number of, of national partners. But I think the, the, the important part here is that uh, is really to look at how we can start to integrate meta metadata in a more global fashion and make that more accessible for a larger research community. In, in a similar vein, we have worked very closely with the Global Alliance for Genomic and Health so to establish GA4GH beacons uh, within Elixir. And uh, for those of you who, who don't know what the beacon is, it's a very, very simple data discovery web service. And it simply answers the question, 
do you have in your cohort or data set any information about a specific allele, in the slide is the allele C, on a specific position in, in the human genome, in a, in a specific reference genome? And uh, it's a web service and it will give you either a yes or a no as an answer. Optionally, it can also provide you some metadata about the allele. And, and of course, if you have, and now there is over 60 beacons lit by different organizations and different data sets, you can integrate these in a, in a network, which is called the beacon network. And then you can answer the question, do any of you have this specific information on, on the allele in a, in a specific position? And you can see what data sets that are potentially of interest for you. And, and the reason why this is useful is of course that to look into each of these data sets you will need to go through a data access committee and, and write a proposal to a data access committee. It will have to be reviewed by the data access committee and it may take quite a long time before you actually get to see the data set. And, and knowing that there is something of interest is of course a, a very good start for writing your applications. It's very disappointing to have a no back after uh, four months of uh, of negotiation. So I think this is uh, one of the use cases for the beacons. I think another important use case is that it actually allows to identify study participants of interest for, for instance, personalized medicine studies because you can see if the what centers will have patients with a specific allele or a specific mutation that would be interesting to bring into a trial of, say, a uh, uh, mutation specific new drug. What we have done in, in, in Elixir is to work with a number of national uh, cohort owners and uh, last week we actually uh, two of the speakers uh, in, in, Spain, in France and in Sweden. Uh, but there are of course risks uh, also with simple discovery services. And so what uh, we have done is to help to implement beacon technology in some of our Alexa nodes, but we're also currently looking in to see how we can connect this with the authentication and authorization infrastructure to uh, be able to open up a core, slightly more sensitive cohort to bona fide or registered researchers. Because as many of you know, by uh, a judiciously choice of queries to a beacon, you can actually identify, potentially identify individuals in a data set. Uh, there was a paper out about this last year. And uh, we are working very actively with the uh, LC and the data security working groups within the Global Alliance to look at various options to mitigate against these risks. And, and of course, linking it to uh, registered access is one way of mitigating this. And so again, it's early days. We are uh, testing the technology and during next year there will be a few pilot tests to see how this could work in practice before we, we roll it out at a larger scale. And I think I, I've said uh, this here uh, on the next step and plan. So on the security side, which I think is a, is a really important uh, part of these plans, is to, to look at monitor and re-identification attempts. Um, we're looking at uh, putting, up, putting together a much easier deployment package to bring in uh, more nodes and more national cohorts to deploy. And we have a program for next year which brings together uh, an additional nine nodes to lit beacons. And, and of course, uh, it is not necessarily limited just to genotype data. One could look at similar mechanisms for other types of phenotypic data, but that's further down in the future. Um, while theoretical possible, we don't have any technology in that space right now. So, so linked with the beacon is, of course, the, the metadata. And, and we have, uh, within Elixir, uh, partnered with the Global Alliance to try to develop the, the metadata schema, the GA for GH metadata schema a little bit more. This is work led by Michael Bordis at the RayMap in, in Switzerland. Uh, the work has just started, but it's really about uh, enriching the metadata schema and trying to use um, ontology services to be able to, in a standardized way, describe the cohorts and the, the sample metadata uh, reproducibly between different implementations. Um, we're also looking to see if one can provide a sort of beacon plus with um, a bit more information on things like structural variants or doing disease-specific queries. 
Um, but again, these are early days, and, and the project will probably um, have more tangible results towards mid next year. It just started. So, uh, so much about the discovery part, but of course, um, I think the, the deposition part can be sometimes be equally challenging. And in in Europe, there has been quite a lot of work within the IMI funding framework. And uh, uh, last year, we partnered up with a, a my a project called OncoTrack that um, does have an open data mandate. They are required to deposit data by the end of their uh, project. But just like many other uh, projects, and in particular many other IMI projects, this was never really planned out in the in the study proposal, and so it wasn't was neither planned nor costed appropriately. So what we have done is we have performed a scoping study together with IMI and using OncoTrack as a test case to see how one can address this sort of long-term knowledge management requirement and the data storage requirements. And uh, these are, of course, uh, issues around the storage, but more so around data governance. How do you long-term manage consent and access? And how do you actually do metadata mappings? And, and I think OncoTrack has provided a very, very interesting uh, for this uh, because of the very rich metadata. And so where we are right now is that we've managed to establish a data access committee. and. Uh, the uh, the costs and the management of the cost for the uh, archival and the running of the DAC has been established within OncoTrack, so, so we have the governance structures in place. And uh, we have also worked in the submission part to see where do we actually need to improve the sample representations. Uh, OncoTrack have a very, very rich phenotype data set with uh, multiple technical replicates, multiple samples from the same patients and so on. And, and so this required extensions of the metadata schemas that I, I think will be very valuable for the future. So that's another important learning. The project is now wrapping up. The data is in the process of being deposited in the EGA. And so once the project finish, it will be available for reuse by, by the larger research community. I think it has also generated uh, quite a lot of interest with, within IMI, and so we're looking to see how we could partner with further projects to make sure that, that other users can access these rich data sets uh, also for the future. There is a touching point with Transmart here, and, and OncoTrack, as several of you know in the audience, have um, also run a Transmart instance, and and uh, the the Luxembourg node in Elixir uh, with Reinhard Schneider has been working very actively to to look at long-term storage of Transmart instances. So this is a, a question that we will now that uh, Luxembourg recently joined Elixir, we will come back to with some more intensity. So I, I hope we will uh, provide a little bit more of guidance during next year as well as as they become fully embedded. Uh, and uh, also related to Transmart, and I think uh, Raymond alluded to this project in, in the introduction, we've uh, teamed up with uh, our Dutch colleagues within TRAIT to see how one can use uh, an archive such as the EGA as a long-term storer for raw data and access that in, um, uh, from tools such as Transmart via unified interfaces and workflow environments such as Ga Galaxy. And I think this this is uh, is an interesting test. Uh, this is Nicholas back again. I, I think we lost the connection at some point. Yes, we got you back. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure when we actually lost it. Um, I'm sorry for this. I hope you didn't miss too much. We lost it from the trade EGA slides. Okay, um, then um, I think in, in terms of uh, wrap up, that was actually towards the end of my talk. So I would just then put on the, uh, I think this is a good time to do questions. It was really the, the, one of the last slides in my talk program. <clears throat> okay, well thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, for us to ask questions, we have to use one of the mics. So if you have a question, raise your hand, we'll get you a mic. Can you open up the questions. 
There's one. Carrot. I'm sorry, did you repeat the question? Looks like those batteries weren't good. Sorry. Yeah, just a second. We're getting another mic. Is it not on, maybe? The on button's on the bottom of the mic. On the bottom. Hello? Hello? Yeah. There it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Nicholas, thank you. This is Gerrit. That's, uh, that's why it took some time. Uh, you know, I'm slow. Um, a great presentation. Uh, one thing I was uh, wondering, uh, perhaps you could allude a little bit on, and that is how um, Elixir fits into the ecosystem of uh, other infrastructures that also act in the uh, personalized uh, medicine research domain. And that's a great question, uh, Harriet, and, and those were the three slides that got cut out when <laughs> the connection dropped. <laughs> so, so, of course, we, we in, in Europe there are a number of other research infrastructures, such as the Artris for uh, translational research and BBMRI that brings together the biobanks and so on. And, and we work together uh, in a project called Corbell, um, to, to improve the interfaces between these uh, research infrastructures. And I, I, uh, what I uh, wanted to highlight is actually an open call that we have for projects to engage across multiple research infrastructure where we, in exchange for access for, to, uh, to advanced uh, technologies and samples, we uh, uh, want to analyze the workflows and see where are the bottlenecks in the workflows and, and so on. So I, I think we fit, uh, we fit together as a sort of a glue. What I, I think Alexia can provide is, is long-term stability for management of data interfaces and uh, serve as a sort of guarantor for some of the standards. And I think that will be uh, really helpful for other infrastructures as they need to um, sustain also their data management processes. Uh, we're doing this with uh, the Artris, but also, for instance, with the mouse infrastructure, such as uh, the InfraFrontier, the, the mouse archives, where we look at how we can uh, long-term preserve data from the phenotyping uh, experiments and the standards and the ontologies used for annotation and so on. Nicholas, hi, this is Case from Bokov. Uh, since uh, Alexir is a... Um, a long-standing research infrastructure, uh, more or less permanent, I would say. Um, what can Elixir offer in terms of helping open source community like Transmart? For example, Transmart Foundation uh, organizes meetings, uh, brings people together. You know, does Elixir have some kind of funding for these network activities? In, so this this is a tricky question, Kirs, because if you say yes, you you open the gates to every open source community on the planet, <laughs> and and so we are working with these communities, but we are trying and we have started to put in place a governance process for what we actually bring into as part of the infrastructure, um, because um, we. Um, you can't offer this to, to everything on the planet. There needs to be an assessment of what is important enough a community and what is a central enough tool for the research community in Europe to actually actively support and work with them. So I, there is, a, there is a, a, in principle, yes, but one has to be careful, of course, to, to make a judgment on what you are promoting or supporting within an infrastructure because there are many, many, many open source communities out there. Yeah. On the tool side, so one of the things that we are trying to put in place through Accelerate is actually simplified, um, a simplified environment for running things like community benchmarking. That may not be very relevant for the Transmart community, but it's very relevant for other of the open source communities. So there we're trying to provide essentially a scalable framework where communities can come together and, and do that in in an easier and in a simpler way to, to do things like benchmarking. 
Yeah, so Transmart is used in dozens of IMI projects, uh, is used in trade, um, is used in the US, so it's used by a lot of pharma companies. So I think it's an important tool for translational medicine research. Um, yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, from your perspective, um, if we were to also want to market Transmart to maybe a consortium of people that don't know it yet as a data management tool, what would you say are important for it to consider? So, uh, from, from a Nexus perspective, uh, it, there is a very large bottom-up component of the Nexus. Um, because we are not a distributed infrastructure, we uh, rely on, so, I mean, the, the central part of the Nexus is the technical system. So, um, you don't do any development in and so the national networks and national nodes. This and this is it. <laughs> um, it's it's breaking up again. Can't sorry, really hear you. It's you're breaking up. Okay, sorry for this. Maybe you can. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. I, I can see the, the networks seem to be a little bit unreliable. Uh, but what I was saying, the, the important part, uh, the important aspect there is to position uh, the tool and the, the, the tool within the national the national nodes because the, the governance and principle within the Nexus builds on proposals from the national nodes. Okay, thanks. Uh, Nicholas, this is Raymond. Um, you made the point that it's very important to uh, have our translational research studies made fair. Now, if I want to motivate my colleagues to invest extra time in making their studies fair, what do you advise me as the best strategy? So, uh, <laughs> one big motivator for many uh, research consultants is, of course, to be obliged to do this via the grant. <laughs> but uh, but I think uh, so there, are, there are two things. So, so one is, and, and I think we all know this, is that if you make if you make it easier to uh, to be fair, if it, if you make it easier to manage your data, you, you are losing me. I think. Almost. Yeah. But so I, I think there are two. Parts of that answer. One is to make it easier to use standards directly in annotation, and the other one is to help to capture the value for the individual researcher when their data is being reduced. So, for instance, I think the structured biology community, it didn't happen by accident that their data is intensively reused. There was a lot of resistance in the beginning, uh, but 20 years down the road, it's unthinkable not to make your uh, biological structures better. It costs quite a lot of money to do structures. Uh, but it's simply a community expectation. And for the individual researcher, they also know that making the data available drive adaptation to their papers. OK. I look around. Is there any other questions? If not, Nicholas, thank you very much for your uh, great presentation.